Hello and welcome to another episode of the Insulin 360 podcast, the podcast that takes a deep dive into metabolic health. I'm your host, Joe, and today we've got a very special guest with us. I'll be speaking with Marek Doyle, who's a functional nutritionist based in London in the UK. Marek's got a master's in personalized nutrition and lots of other training under his belt. But the real reason I want to speak to him today is for his wealth of clinical experience. Um, over the last 19 years, he's worked with over three and a half thousand patients. And in that time, he's run upwards of 13,000 different tests. So organic acid testing, genetic profiles, uh, hormonal testing, and everything in between. And all of that data and his personal observations and research has led to a, a really in-depth and unique view of uh, insulin issues, of metabolic health, and of health in general. So in this first part of the episode, we get into what it actually means to be metabolically healthy. We talk about the difference between insulin dysfunction and perhaps a healthy adaptation. We get into talking about the mitochondria, into how they impact insulin, uh, metabolic health more broadly speaking, and also some of the main drivers behind mitochondrial dysfunction that Marek sees in practice. We talk about the liver and the gut and the importance of the health of these two uh, critical areas for insulin health and metabolic health. And then we get on to talking about the organic acids test, uh, when it may be appropriate, when perhaps it may not be appropriate, uh, and also some of the key markers that Marek looks out for when running through this test with people. So if you want to know more about Marek, head on over to his website, marekdoyle.com, where he runs a busy and thriving practice working one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with clients. Um, he also runs his academy there, which is an advanced training program for healthcare providers, where he imparts some of his wisdom to future practitioners. And as always, if you want to know more about Insulin360, head on over to our website uh, where you can sign up for the newsletter and of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And with that, let's get on with the episode. Hi, Marek. How are you doing today? Uh, all good this side. What about yourself? Great, thanks. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Glad to have you with us today. Um, so we've got a lot to get through today and um, the focus is going to be generally on um, metabolic health, um, diving into some insulin issues. So maybe a good place to start would be, um, what does it actually mean to be metabolically healthy? Okay, well, I guess there's a number of different definitions we could lean on there. But one that I think works well is that this is a point at which we can tolerate all reasonable blends of dietary intake without any undesirable outcomes. We have the ability to respond to all manner of reasonable metabolic demands. And equally, we manage our energy stores in a way that is beneficial and leaves us without any undue risk of uh, unwanted health issues later on down the line. So in that regard, that would translate to the front line as somebody being able to eat high or low fat, high or low carb, uh, to break down those foods well, to exploit their energy well. It means that, yeah, we can take on physical loads, be that training or simply yeah, the stresses and strains that real life throws at us and providing that's not excessive and uh, unduly sustained, then, yeah, we respond very well to that. It doesn't knock us about. And equally, that, yeah, we have energy for mental tasks, physical challenges. It's there and it's available when needed, but equally, it's not stored in excess. We do not become obese. So that would be sure. yeah, the, the fundamentals and the, the real life implications of what I would define as uh, yeah, being metabolically healthy. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think something key that comes out of that is the uh, ability to switch fuels because um, obviously the reason why uh, humans have become successful in pretty much every environment on the earth is that uh, we're able to switch different fuel sources, which is quite unusual. I guess, um, in the, you know, animal world, well, animals, um, 
not so much, but uh, usually uh, animals or, or lot the life forms focus on one particular fuel source. But um, we have this ability to switch between um, all sorts of different substrates. So, um, well, yeah, it's very impressive. And I've studied human physiology for a long time, and there's a lot of words we could throw at the whole subject but impressive is probably the most reasonable it's yeah very um very clear how the main strength humans have in evolutionary terms is our adaptability and so in that regard not only can we survive and thrive on such a varied range of intakes we yeah can can store it when it's appropriate to do so. We can you know, reduce our energy expenditure when it's appropriate to do so. We're the ultimate survival machines. And obviously that is something that we should take in mind when people talk about what's the best diet for humans. And of course, yeah, you have the, the diet wars, um, which we never necessarily need to uh, work hard to find uh sure, and... i was gonna say in fact because if we bring that forward to today in the modern world 2023 uh what we see is we see no this food is the best this macronutrient is the best no eat high fat no eat high carb um and then of course we have the industry influences they want to promote their particular macronutrients above others we've seen that for decades um, but really, um, it's interesting to think that um, a sign of health is the ability to switch and use effectively use uh, each of those um, without having the negative consequences of, um, yeah. Well, exactly that. And so there are plenty of occasions when I'm working one to one with individuals and they might ask me, a question that relates either to themselves or just generally out of curiosity, what, what is the best diet in your opinion? And of course, there's no one answer to that question because it depends on what we're looking to achieve. And if a human being, one that has the genetic legacies of their ancestors that have evolved in a cyclic environment one whereby there would have been higher levels of carbohydrates available at certain times of year and much less so at others well we're going to see that reflected in in their their capacities but also in their evolutionary behaviors that is to say that humans get great benefits when there's excessive carbohydrates, high insulin, but not if it's sustained for long periods of time, especially if it's uh, sustained at a moment when we can't necessarily process the carbohydrates in the way we'd want or to respond to the insulin in the way that we'd want. Sure, uh, but yeah. in a time when insulin is low, when there is more of a catabolic breakdown state in the body, there's a lot of substantial benefits that are accessed in that particular state in other words yeah you take a human being who spent three four decades or more without ever spending any sustained time in a catabolic state only anabolic they haven't ever been truly hungry for decades well they're going to miss out on a ton of those benefits that i allude to and that's why there's a lot of people who will discover uh, a ketogenic diet and become evangelical about why it is the best because certainly when it's done well in somebody who stands to benefit from it and somebody who hasn't accessed the, these benefits that have been waiting for them and would have traditionally been accessed seasonally well suddenly yeah they're going to feel the dramatic difference in the same way that most people who've eaten one way for years upon years upon years when they change it to a decidedly different intake they will often find that there's massive benefits uh, so yeah this is where i need to identify well when are these approaches helpful and uh, how 
would we identify that? Sure. Okay, great. And that's really what I want to focus on. Um, and that's what came out when I was um, doing my research was that uh, the focus should be on dysfunction when we're talking about insulin or any of the other hormones which are involved. Uh, and not necessarily, there's this tendency these days to categorize thing as, things as good and bad. And yeah. we want the answer. And there's this polarization that's um, you know, choosing the ideal thing and then sticking with it for the rest of your life. Whereas um, it's much more about um, insulin as being like uh, functional or dysfunctional. And so, um, yeah. That makes a lot of sense because it's very much human nature to classify things into good or bad. Uh, it avoids all of that cognitive dissonance that uh, we just really don't like as a species. But yeah, everybody forgets that almost all of the downsides that we see are not the downsides that we see in relation to insulin. They're not necessarily insulin's effects. They're what happens when our response to insulin becomes dysregulated. Uh, so as many of the issues will actually center on the lack of insulin activity, um, just as it may do on the excess insulin activity at different parts. And that's where, yeah, whether we're looking at the anabolic buildup effect, the growth effect for, for muscles, for neurons, or we're looking at the pro oxide effects for circulation or the pro-metabolic effects for various different tissues across the body. Um, yeah, the key thing there being that, yeah, we're looking at the, the need for maintaining good response to insulin. I think that's really valuable to focus on the dysfunction of insulin and um, to highlight the fact that we have evolved to take advantage of both the fed state when insulin is high and the fasted state when insulin is low. And so insulin is not just something which gets blood sugar into our cells. It's more of a kind of metabolic switch. So it signals to all of our different tissues to respond to the resources at hand. And so uh, a fed state, we're going to be storing uh, a faster state, we're going to be liberating glycogen, um, fat storage, um, all, all these sorts of things. And so to be able to respond appropriately in each different situation, is going to be a key um, marker of health. And that's really where I want to get to is um, moving away from that kind of reductionist, you know, I eat high carb because uh, saturated fat raises cholesterol, or I eat low carb because insulin is uh, the devil. Um, I think it's um, perhaps it's a necessary stage to move on to, to um, a deeper understanding about things. Um, and hopefully, um, yes, that's what we'll get to. So, um, so then, is insulin the reason why we get fat? This is, might be a question that somebody who has just found the, um, the, the ketogenic diet, uh, they may hold this belief. So, um, yeah, so it's complicated. Uh, absolutely. There's a central role for our insulin status in gaining weight, becoming obese for sure. But as you might imagine with the human body, it's always just a little bit more complicated than that. And so, yeah, there's definitely something worth touching on, which is to actually separate uh, obesity and getting fat from insulin resistance. Because once we see people moving further down the spectrum towards metabolic dysfunction, they're generally going to exist together. But in the early stages, we often than see one or the other. And this is where a couple of principles are probably worth, worth touching on. One is that insulin sensitivity slash insulin resistance is actually adaptive. And there is an optimal level of insulin sensitivity that will vary depending on the circumstance and will vary by the compartment that we're looking at. So 
the same individual can have differing levels of insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance uh, the liver or the muscles or the fat cells and that is going to have a profound impact on how they respond to higher carb higher insulin release so one particular pattern worth touching on there is that uh, yeah if you have insulin resistance at the liver something that you could induce through a combination of overnutrition overeating especially if there's any liver specific challenges and you know that could range from the less common such as viral hepatitis or to the particularly common such as endotoxemia which is where due to either inflammatory chaos in the gut or stress induced opening of channels in the gut regardless of the root cause what we see is this increased permeability in the gut lining and suddenly little fragments of endotoxins pour in endotoxemia is the result which does have a very potent effect on the liver which is obviously uh in the, the front line to anything that comes in through the intestinal lining so yeah and maybe um we would add to that as well like visceral fat as well because the the free fatty acids flowing straight into the liver from visceral fat um also has this effect so the gut and the liver are are key in all of this and and what we have around our waist as well oh very much so and that's something that's probably worth touching on the difference between fat that jiggles which everybody seems to hate and is actually quite healthy and protective versus the visceral fat the uh yeah abdominal fat which tends to yeah pour straight into the liver for want of a, a more uh eloquent uh breakdown and that's where yeah it, it's going to have different effects but but in any case yeah if we see these challenges at the liver which is typically yeah a combination of too much energy being delivered there with impairment to its ability to handle that well we may, may well get some insulin resistance at those cells and that's pretty important because now we're going to see a gradual rise in the necessary uh, release of insulin. In other words, we're going to need more insulin to control blood glucose because it's not being taken up in the same way at the liver. The more insulin you've got, the more impetus there is for fat storage at cells. So that's one way through which insulin resistance can actually now contribute to a progressive building of fat cells. Insulin resistance can make you fat. However, what we can often see is the other way around, which is where we actually might see insulin resistance at the fat cells, uh, an appropriate level of insulin resistance in some cases, or unusually high levels of resistance. Those individuals are actually not going to get fat. And this is such an important principle. And I know that most times I teach this in my academy program, people will often ask, well, hang on, how can insulin resistance protect us against obesity? And the key thing is we need to break it down by phase. And that's where it becomes more understandable. But yes, in the early phases, you often want some degree of insulin resistance at your fat cells, and that will stop them from overly accumulating energy and becoming full. Um, but you still want some degree of insulin sensitivity because the job of the fat cells is, is something of a sponge. When there is excess energy in the bloodstream, they sponge it up, which serves two purposes. One, they're protecting the bloodstream and the liver from energetic overload but also that's a store of energy which can be used at a later date when it's necessary so that healthy fat cell function problems occur when the fat cells do too much of that they're asked to sponge up too much energy and before you know it they become full and that's when the game changes and that's where the fat cells say no more 
there is no more space at the yin and they start to elicit insulin resistance. Now, of course, the burden of energy is back in the bloodstream and the liver and suddenly we're going to see this contagion of energy overload, which means the cells are going to have to resort to insulin resistance to protect themselves from over energy. And that's the uh, oxidative stress that results. So consequently, now the liver joins in. Now the liver is also insulin resistant. This is big problems. This is where we're going to need a lot more insulin release to control the um, to control the rising glucose. And in the early stages, that's exactly what will happen. It will control it, but at a cost, which is now to override the insulin resistance at all cells, including the fat cells, and thus force extra uh, fat accumulation. And then it's interesting how the fat cells are pretty good uh, in high insulin states at finding a means to build more fat cells, build larger fat cells to find a little bit more space in those emergency situations. And it is a metabolic emergency. Now there's obesity, there's insulin resistance. So hopefully that delineated how you can actually see a lack of weight gain, a resistance to weight gain, if the fat cells themselves have uh, insulin resistance. Yeah, great. And I want to pull out a few things from there because that's really interesting, the fact that it's tissue specific, because that suggests that it's not just everything breaking down, but it suggests that there is some sort of intelligent partitioning of resources going on, some intelligent decision making. And what I found fascinating um, was that um, uh, it depends where the fat is. Like you say, the, the jiggly fat is the fat that we have um, when we think about uh, obesity, um, but it takes a lot of kilos of fat, uh, subcutaneous fat in that way to start causing metabolic havoc. Whereas if you look at the visceral fat, then we're talking just a couple of kilos of visceral fat. And then if we look at the intrahepatic, the, the, the liver fat, then we're talking about just a few hundred grams. And so the, the positioning of that fat is going to be very important for uh, this uh, dysfunction to take place. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, and also, yes, the, the tissue specific stuff. So um, I think this is key because what we hear a lot uh, is I'm insulin resistant. Uh, and this is uh, proposed as a kind of negative thing. And so I've got this problem, how can I become more insulin sensitive? Uh, but really, the question we should be asking is, uh, why uh, are we insulin resistant in a particular tissue and insulin sensitive in another one? What's the body trying to do? Uh, is there actually dysfunction going on? Or is the body adapting to a, a different uh, situation? And I remember, yes, like, for example, people can remain skinny, but still get insulin resistance. So they start off with insulin resistance in the muscles. Then we start to see the insulin, uh, the pancreas trying to compensate, producing more insulin. We've got hyperinsulinemia that generates some negative effects like um, nitric oxide problems, like endothelial inflammation, that sort of thing. Um, or we could have, uh, and then, okay, so that situation could go ahead and then lead to um, liver resistance and eventually to, to fat resistance. Or like you said, um, endotoxemia, um, visceral fat, uh, this process could actually start in the liver and then branch out from there. So I think it's really important to, that, that people uh, ask, uh, where am I insulin resistant? Where am I insulin sensitive? Is it an adaptation or is it dysfunction? So we don't really get that information from like our basic lab testing or looking at somebody. So how can we tell the difference, do you think, between an adaptation or, or actually dysfunction? So I would say it's actually quite easy to tell the difference between uh, an adaptive shift in insulin sensitivity versus uh, a maladaptive shift and it all comes down to context that is to say does it fit with what we're expecting 
to see. So, for example, on a ketogenic diet, uh, which is by definition a carbohydrate restricted diet, there's not that much glucose uh, being formed from the diet. There will always be uh, maintenance of blood sugar levels because the brain still needs some glucose in uh, ketogenic states, even though the needs are substantially reduced compared to uh, a carbohydrate based baseline. But nonetheless, um, one of the ways that the body manages to maintain that supply to those neurons that still want that glucose is by maintaining some insulin resistance at the cells. And this is often referred to as physiological insulin resistance so that those cells that can run particularly well on fatty acids and do so, well, they go ahead and run on fatty acids, meaning that there's less depletion of the glucose pools and thus the cells that truly want that glucose that need that glucose for optimal function which is approximately about 40 grams worth of uh, usage per day on the ketogenic diet well now they can grab that without undue competition so yeah that would be a perfect example of when we'd expect to see that when we would want to see that that's how the human body has evolved to function. Great. But yeah, if we're seeing problems with insulin sensitivity in a way that's harming brain function, energy metabolism in, in, in the brain, or we're looking at uh, issues that are helping to contribute to inflammation or you know, some of those other issues we've touched on, such as the nitric oxide and subsequent circulation, well, suddenly, yeah, that's in no way adaptive um so the simple question is does this make sense is this helping and that's not difficult to answer as long as we give the slightest glance to the text yeah okay so yes that's when it's uh, really useful to have a clinical perspective and that's what was interesting about uh, now me going ahead with this podcast and talking to people who are actually dealing with this day in day out or these sorts of problems is because then uh, what's really important is talking to the person in front of you. Um, how do they feel throughout the day? How's their energy? Do they collapse after eating? Can they go for a few hours without eating and feel just fine and mentally clear and all of these sorts of signs and symptoms? And of course, um, these are two key um, examples of where insulin resistance is uh, an evolutionary benefit is one, like you say, where um, it's prioritizing uh, glucose for the central nervous system. Um, I think anybody who wakes up in the night with the, the shakes and feeling sweaty palms and a bit of adrenaline and the racing heart, uh, the body is, is trying to probably do just that, I'd imagine. And, um, you know, prioritizing glucose for the, for the brain. And also um, the fact that we live on planet Earth and it's seasonal and, um, you know, winter is, has historically not been an easy time for, for, for any animals. So um, to um, induce some insulin resistance in the autumn, to store some of those uh, calories, some of that food coming in um, to prepare for the winter is also a kind of uh, adaptation. And of course, if we're eating fruit um, in that particular period and fructose has this particular affinity for generating this this um this situation in the liver the trouble is it, it takes on a different um a, a different um issue if we're then drinking uh high fructose corn syrup flavored drinks 24 7 all throughout the year so this is another point i think which um is useful to highlight is that uh we tend to think fructose good fructose bad but uh, fructose in the context of... Um, it's natural. Sure. <laughs> natural fruit sugar. Yeah, just uh, extracted in labs and then concentrated with all the other nutrients removed. But other than that, it's, it's natural. Sure. Like cyanide. <laughs> sure. Well, that's exactly. When you're eating the whole fruit, um, you're getting a lot more than just fructose. I mean, you're getting polyphenols, which are changing your the way your body responds to blood sugar, you're getting fiber. And, and of course, um, um, glutting on fruit in the autumn um, has been a, a useful survival, uh, a 
survival technique in the, in the past years. No, exactly. And, and I think that uh, sometimes, yeah, it can feel a little bit overwhelming when we sort of talk about these things like, oh, you thought fructose was good. Well, it turns out it's really not. Or we talk about, you know, oh, you thought the healthy polyunsaturates were good. Well, actually, look what they do to weight gain, so on and so forth. The key thing being that if you're introducing energy to the body, the energy has to go somewhere. So, of course, yes, it is absolutely true that you see substantially less rises in blood sugar levels when you consume fructose. And that is something that we would identify as desirable. The question is, well, where's that energy going then? Is it simply that it takes longer to absorb? Well, if there's fiber alongside it, if there's fat alongside it, that may well be the case. Uh, but if it's simply being introduced into the system and it's not ending up in the bloodstream, where's it gone? And so this is where, yeah, fructose takes a different metabolic pathway. We won't go into that, but if people want to do their own Googling or PubMedding, then looking at the diphosphofructokinase enzymes that process it. And this is where, yeah, it's particularly well suited to load the liver in a way that encourages fat storage. Great if you have this resource available at a particular point of the year, just ahead of a phase where you might be expecting to need those fat reserves. So yeah, that is that sensible to to consider that rather than looking at it as good or bad, we just recognize well, what's the mechanisms and what scenarios is that going to be helpful? And if somebody wants to protect their liver, they know that there is signs of insulin resistance there. Maybe they've done a fatty acids profile and it's shown that, yeah, there's hints of that lipotoxic pattern where the the liver is storing too many droplets of fat per cell. It's trying its best to compromise. And one of the things we see is insulin resistance. So, um, yeah, that's a time when they might want to go easy on the fruit, while other people without that issue might find that this is a super, e super easy to digest food that comes with the you know, very rich nutrient content that it could be a very useful part of their diet. So circumstance specific. Sure. Okay, good. So I think um, we can say that uh, whenever we're trying to make decisions about our own health, then uh, it's always good to consider the context. Um, and it's uh, as a general rule, the the more novel uh, a food or food like substance is, then the more caution we should apply to that. So um, there's a huge difference between uh, fruits uh, and there's um, and high fructose corn corn syrup in a in um in a fizzy drink um but there are also perhaps times when fruit is not ideal for that person given all of the other challenges that they might be facing so i think uh that nuanced approach is what's kind of missing from the whole metabolic health um you know um area yeah well yeah and i think as you say there are times when it might not be helpful. And, and this is where, yeah, it's very easy to sort of almost pick a team. In that regard, some people would very rightfully say that, well, look at the difference between high fructose corn syrup versus fruit, which is a particularly good source of fructose. We're going to see very different things and thus we can take away from that, that yeah, this, this novel extraction of components of food we need to be really weary of it. But equally, there is some tendency there to look at, well, just just do exactly what our ancestors did, uh, eat exactly how they ate, which definitely makes sense. But we want to bear in mind that if we're going to do that, we're often applying those formulas at a time when we're not living outdoors, we're not getting the exposure to the sunshine or to the cold. We're not spending the time with our nearest and dearest in that would have been so natural for those ancestors. We're often overworking, we're undersleeping. The nutrient density of the foods might be different, but most importantly of all, yeah, have we sustained major shifts in our microbiome 
that's going to change the way that we break down these foods? You know, is there going to be excessive fermentation in a way that never would likely have come uh, come come up to the surface with you know, our ancestors? And that's where, yeah, recognizing that we as a modern society often do have specific metabolic challenges that's where yeah we want to make allowances for that now maybe that means taking an organic acids test seeing where in those energy production pathways we're seeing specific obstacles in our own case and compensating for that if that means providing additional b1 or providing additional carnitine or coq10 or whatever mitochondrial specific nutrient we're talking about well that can make a massive difference and allow us to access the benefits of this evolutionary inspired diet without having to assume that it was good for them then and we'll get the exact same response because our starting point may well be at a, a disadvantage for those mm. reasons I've yeah sure i mean and also uh what we're doing in our lives because like you say uh, it's all very well to follow a, a a a sort of paleo style diet but um we're not living uh in in paleo ways most of us most of us are uh, spending too much time indoors not enough time in the sun we're using our perhaps brains in front of the computer more than we're doing our using our muscles to go hunt, hunting and gathering or even agrarian you know lifestyles uh, would have had a much higher carb tolerance and um <clears throat> i remember um, i don't remember who it was but um um there's this idea that uh um pro cyclists or pro athletes uh, remain incredibly insulin sensitive, even if they've had a huge carbo rich meal, because their um, mitochondrial density is vastly different from most most of us or, um, you know, and there would be similar changes, although I guess um, uh, people farming the land uh, wouldn't have had the kind of um, the kind of the kind of mitochondrial changes that a, a pro cyclist would have had, but they would have certainly been a good deal different from your average office worker um, of today. So I think that yeah. brings us nicely also because you mentioned the organic acids test, it brings us nicely onto the mitochondria. We've mentioned it a few times, but so this can be a, um, a key um, driver perhaps of insulin resistance uh, when we have mitochondrial <clears throat> dysfunction. Um, what does that actually mean? What do the mitochondria do? and why or how could they become dysfunctional okay so yeah what i want to touch on is how and why they might become dysfunctional and equally on how that could end up contributing to insulin resistance issues uh, so one very important concept to bear in mind here is that insulin resistance is a you know, well-evolved uh, adaption to energy overload. It is protective of the cells because of what would happen if there was too much energy flowing through these energy production pathways. Um, so, yeah, let's bear that in mind because, yeah, where do most of the oxidative stress come from in the human body. It's in the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So let's break down that jargon. What is the mitochondria? The mitochondria are often referred to as the energy furnaces of the cell. And that's a pretty good analogy because in that final stage of energy production, uh, the electron transport chain, what we've essentially got is this conveyor belt that's taking the breakdown products from food energy, that is to say the proteins, the fats, the carbs that have been brought into the mitochondria, fed into the Krebs cycle, this biochemical dance that progressively strips them down into their most basic components, the electrons, which can now enter this final stage, the electron transport chain, the conveyor belt that holds these electrons and then ultimately supplies them to the furnace, stage four of the electron transport chain, which is where they are essentially combusted with oxygen. And this is where we form ATP at the next step. This is where it's human energy 
that can be used to stock up the cells and power cellular processes. So that's all good and well. But what if there is something slowing down the uh, oxygen availability? That's going to slow down the furnace. That's going to see these highly reactive energy compounds backing up and stacking up. And we really don't want this over accumulation of these highly reactive energy compounds, because when that happens, we're going to get a lot of reactions. We're going to get a lot of oxidative stress. And so that's where we see very tightly controlled regulation within the mitochondria and the cell itself to limit the flow of energy in those circumstances to avoid the backing up and stacking up that I described. Sure. So and one thing that, that sorry comes to mind is that is that um, is some level of oxidative stress produced by the mitochondria physiological? Yes, or... always. Okay, sure. So there is always a certain amount of oxidative stress that's produced at the mitochondria. And that's a really helpful signaling. This is where, of course, we, we often refer to oxidative stress as bad, but we need a certain level to maintain energy metabolism. Um, so yeah, so there's always uh, an amount of oxidative stress that's produced in the mitochondria whenever they're working in an adaptive fashion. And the, the key thing is that this is another example of where we can easily look at oxidative stress as bad. And it's often described that way, whereas actually that's referring to excessive and sustained oxidative stress, which can start to contribute to cellular damage and have a whole variety of unwanted consequences. It can also drive insulin resistance. But the key thing is, you know, we need a certain level of oxidative stress and the reactive oxygen species that are produced, for example, in the mitochondria to induce adaptive behaviors. One of the best examples is all the research on vitamin C supplementation after exercise in that you lose the adaptive responses. You don't get the strength gains if you supplement athletes with vitamin C after mm, exercise. Interesting. Which again, yeah, is often totally contrary to uh, expectations. But it's just one example of where a certain amount, the right amount of oxidative stress is exactly what we want. The problem, of course, is too much is categorically going to damage the mitochondria and that will end up killing the mitochondria, which will end up killing the cell, which will end up killing the organ, which will end up killing the human being. And this is where as soon as the oxidative stress rises to undesirable levels, we see this shutdown in the flow of these energy compounds. And that's something that you can actually see on the organic acids test when you look at the ratio between citric acid and aconitic acid. That's controlled by an enzyme called aconitase, which is a key player in inducing that shutdown that I speak of. And that is in response to the excessive oxidative stress, which most of the time is going to occur because of that backing up and stacking up of those electrons, which in itself occurs as a consequence of a lack of oxygen arriving to meet the energy demand, to combust that food energy that's being loaded into the cell. Sure. Okay, great. That's really useful. So uh, if I could give a, a bit of context as, as well and a summary of that then. So um, we've got these mitochondria, they're bacteria like organelles that at some point in long, long ago, millions of years, they were engulfed into our um, into eukaryocytes and um, uh, they have a nice place to live and they produce energy for us. Um, so um, they have their own uh, DNA, um, but they are, yes, they're, they're, they're part of us. And so um, we have higher density of, of our mitochondria in, for example, uh, cells which need high energy like neurons, or heart cells, um, uh, muscle cells, and so on. And occasionally like red blood cells, there won't be any mitochondria. And so their job is to um, the end stage of energy production 
this whole process is basically to break down uh, food uh, into uh, protons and electrons and then use that to generate ATP. Um, and um, amazingly, I, I, I read, I don't know if it's correct, that we produce about our body weight of ATP every single day. And um, maybe 70 or 80% comes from the mitochondria. So they are pretty busy down there. Um, so they don't, <laughs> they don't just do energy uh, production. They're also responsible for lots of other things. They're sensing the environment. They're using, um, yes, communicating with other parts of our body, important for steroidogenesis or ammonia detoxification or other things like this. But they can get overloaded. They can get damaged. Uh, overeating is something you mentioned as being key for this. When we take in too much, uh, they get overwhelmed. There starts to get electron leakage. Then that goes on to create superoxide. And then that can um, start to interfere with insulin signaling and all sorts of other things inside the cell. So the cell, um, we tend to think of insulin as kind of sending the orders. Uh, but really, it's the cell that is guaranteeing, trying to guarantee survival. And so if there's too much of something coming in, then it's going to react to limit what's coming in. And so that would be the physiological stuff that you um, uh, allude to. Uh, but uh, this can become excessive, dysfunctional, and then the cell starts to break down and we start to um, get real, real trouble. And I think that's something key that we see in uh diabetes or insulin related conditions, um, you know, with heart, um, hypertension, or when somebody is um, tending towards uh, heart disease, uh, chronic inflammation, that sort of thing, is this dysfunction, too much oxidative stress, uh, that is then uh, um, interfering with all sorts of cellular processes. So, um, what about testing then? You mentioned the organic acids testing. We want to obviously keep our, uh, maybe before we get on to testing, let's talk about the main things which you see when you're dealing with patients, because um, we obviously have a, a lot of experience, uh, many thousands of patients under your belt and lots of testing going on there. So I'd really like to know what are the main reasons uh, behind these mitochondria um, becoming dysfunctional, not working properly, producing too much oxidative stress? So yeah, I think the the key thing there is that there's never going to be just one pattern that we would see. Uh, but one pattern that certainly stands out because of the implications it has, and also because of the frequency that I see that in the individuals that I work with, is this pattern of mitochondrial hypoxia and i actually touched on that earlier in that the organic acids test will flag that through the low activity of the econotase and thus a low level of aconitic acid upon the test results and that's where you can often have totally normal access to oxygen and yet either because of anemia, poor delivery to the cell, or excess hydrogen sulfide production in the gut, which is the case that hydrogen sulfide is a gas that has some beneficial effects, but at high levels can compete with oxygen, meaning that, yeah, the oxygen is there, but uh, can you access it effectively? So this would be something we see with SIBO, um, or is this also something that yeah. uh, we see with... Sulfide. Dominant other, other conditions. Yeah, so theoretically, it doesn't necessarily need to be the small intestine. Certainly, that's the most common setup where we'd see excessive production of hydrogen sulfide. That's where a uh, microbe called disulfovibrio is most likely to be the suspect. But equally, uh, Enterobacter, Fusobacterium, these have an alternative pathway through which they can end up producing excessive hydrogen sulfide. So this is where, yeah, whenever we see the patterns of a bad reaction to cruciferous vegetables or reaction to sulfites, and especially intestinal gas with a distinctive rotten egg odor, 
100% we want to consider that hydrogen sulfide production. And yeah, stool tests can be quite useful in identifying, you know, which specific uh, form of this uh, excess hydrogen sulfide we're looking at. But nonetheless, yeah, that's one way through a uh, bacterial metabolite, a gas can compete with oxygen and drive these uh, hypoxia issues that I mentioned. Um, as can uh, the inflammatory impact of mold exposure. That's often something that coincides simply because of the type of inflammatory response to mycotoxins often involves changes in the way capillaries perform, uh, one with major implications for that oxygen delivery, but also the single most common uh, driver of, of this low oxygen availability is too much production of nitric oxide and that's obviously something that we've touched on in regards to its positive role and produced in the right amounts in the right places which is to say the blood vessels when we see this endotoxemia that i touched on earlier this movement of these fragments of dead bacteria into the bloodstream well this is where as much as these aren't live bacteria and they can't cause an infection all your immune system is responding to is the ton of bacterial dna that it now finds in circulation it's not evolved to simply leave that be and it doesn't so this is where we get very pronounced inflammatory responses one that's characterized by a lot of production of nitric oxide and this is not produced by endothelial nitric oxide synthase in the blood vessels. This is produced by inducible nitric oxide synthase in the immune cells. And we have different effects in these circumstances. The biggest one being that competition between nitric oxide and oxygen. So this is where there's two consequences of the mitochondrial hypoxia. One, we're producing less energy. The cells are having to make do with less energy. Two, we're also having to slow down the uptake of energy from the bloodstream. And so we're going to transfer that energetic load somewhere else, most likely the liver. So it can certainly set the scene for some systemic insulin resistance, which unfortunately means you've got less energy and you've got worsened energy signaling. So what is your hypothalamus to think? Your hypothalamus, this manager of energy metabolism, this manager of many systems within the body, well, it's constantly asking, how much energy do I have? How much energy do I want? Um, if those two are balanced, then we're all good. But if you have less than your system wants, either because of low cellular stores or because of impaired uh, communication, uh, which is the cellular signaling, such as insulin, or because of theft from inflammatory issues, which insulin resistance is notorious for driving. Well, yeah, add to that what we might call stress, which of course is a, a big nebulous subject, which we probably won't get into. But yeah, that's where we'll see this potent imbalance. What is the hypothalamus going to do here? It's going to activate the stress response, which is specifically there to increase energy availability to help us meet the expected demands. The problem with that is that it's not just dumping out some adrenaline, which will then go on to liberate energy from fat cells or liberate energy from storage at liver, etc. It's also going to open up the gut lining, induce the opening of channels inside the cells themselves. And this is transcellular permeability rather than the other type uh, paracellular permeability that we speak of when there's inflammation in the gut dysbiosis allergies alcohol etc but yes it opens up these channels in the gut and thus you get more endotoxins more nitric oxide more hypoxia at the mitochondria more of these energetic challenges more of an imbalance between what our hypothalamus thinks it has and what it wants and thus we can easily get into these self-perpetuating cycles of dysfunction and suddenly it becomes very 
easy to see why there was that moment for most people when they were 22 or when they were whatever age it was and from that point on they never had the same energy or that they never had that same bounce and from that point on they started to accumulate other aches and pains other little patterns that hey as long as they avoid doing exercise in the evening well that's fine as long as they make sure they have that fourth cup of coffee well that's fine as long as they don't have carbs in lunch and they won't feel tired that and, and that's often where people are having to move further and further into a corner until there's nowhere else left to go. And that's where they'll then take action. The problem being, of course, is that single point action, which is the type that is promoted in this you know, one pill for a real model, will never get on top of it. And that's where, yeah, the organic acids test can identify whether indeed we are seeing this pattern. And whether there's additional issues elsewhere, whether that be in neurotransmitters, or whether that be in the balance of the microbiome, or whether that be responses to certain food chemicals like oxalates or antioxidant status. In any case, it allows us, especially when married up to the case history, to the patterns that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, now we can come away from that knowing, okay, we've got some very clear obvious obstacles that we can take a look at um so one caveat i would just put out there is that as much as that's a very common thing for me to see we should recognize that that's not likely to be a common pattern across society because i've got a self-selecting population people don't come and see me purely to chat tell me how good they're feeling it's generally because they have really invested in trying to improve their health and they haven't got anywhere and now they want to know why so yes um very common in uh, any individual who's not seeing the responses they should probably not so in in the population at large but nonetheless when i test olympic athletes when i test you know members of the general public that might be friends of friends who don't feel bad but are curious to know can they be optimized you still see your fair share of shortages of mitochondrial nutrients and that can be a damaging consequence of microbiome issues bacteria uh helping to steal the nutrients we'd want or it may well be certain metabolic pathways aren't supported due to nutrient shortages in the diet suddenly we're not forming the same level of, of carnitine or creatine choline etc that we might want suddenly yeah there, there's impacts uh, as a result of that we may be over consuming iron uh because there's iron filings in flour well conventional flour anyway um yeah, so, yeah, we really uh, yeah, want to make sure that if we're not avoiding that, that we have enough copper to move it out of the cells. It's copper-dependent uh, enzymes that will do that. But who's eating their liver? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. So um, it's, fa it's funny, actually, because uh, nitric oxide was, was something that I kind of think, oh, it's, it's good in any quantity, you know. I've, uh, I've moved past the whole fructose is good, fructose is bad <laughs> dichotomy, but nitric oxide still needs a bit of work. So, so. I mean, it's, it's just a molecule because, yeah, I, I've over-summarized it there. But, yeah, you've got endothelial NOS, which you generally want for better circulation. Yeah, sure. Uh, but also inducible nitric oxide synthase. But then you've got neuronal nitric oxide synthase, uh, mitochondrial nitric oxide synthase. So, uh there's some, uh, yeah, some things. Sure. To it's add following to the same uh, pattern as what we were talking about, about insulin dysfunction. It's, it's uh, compartmentalized, it's tissue specific. It's got to be at the right location doing the right thing. And of course, as you say, something like endotoxemia complete, completely throw this whole balance out. So, so well, yeah. Exactly so that that we have this incredible uh, result that evolution has left us with this impressive ability to adapt and modify the function of uh, the whole system from yeah mitochondrial level to cellular level to hormonal level to emergent level we've got all of these uh, adaptive capacities but 
at no point was there the opportunity to adapt to not sleeping enough, working far too hard, spending too little time with our friends and families, dumping a ton of untested man-made chemicals into our bloodstream uh, in, in synergy with one another, with you know, taking all the antibiotics from a young age, and then most of all, just pushing and pushing and pushing until the system breaks. That would never have happened. Sure, yes, and that's um, perhaps potentially another key cause. So uh, the main causes that you've touched on there that you see uh, day to day with your, uh, with your patients is um, um, hydrogen sulfide production, potentially in the case of SIBO or otherwise, um, endotoxemia and resulting inflammation and excessive nitric oxide production, uh, and both of these leading to not enough oxygen being used at the level of the mitochondria. Um, and of course, we've got the overnutrition. So people eating uh, too much, too frequently, uh, the hyper palatable foods of our modern age, just, um, you know, hitting all of the um, <laughs> all of the satisfaction centers in the brain. And uh, then, of course, we could go into leptin issues and difficulty controlling hunger. And, and then we add in the kind of modern world um, excess chemicals like uh, triclosan or bisphenol A or phthalates, these sorts of uh, big offenders. Um, and of course, sedentary lifestyles. We're inside most of the time, which we're clearly not getting enough or most people are clearly not getting enough exercise uh, compared to the situation in which we involve, evolved in. And of course, circad circadian rhythms as well might be something that is more um, effective on the broader population uh, to cause these these kind of issues. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing there is, yeah, a lot of these will have noticeable effects, but some, for example, most people who I see anyway, who uh, aren't getting the sunshine, and then I request that they consider seeing some sunshine, they may well not notice any obvious shifts in the early stages, mainly because by definition that they've ended up in my clinic, they have multiple obstacles between them and a fair chance of feeling good, getting that energy investment in their prefrontal cortex that allows for the executive function, the learning, the planning, the timelining, that feeling good, the feeling bright, sharp, bouncy. There's multiple steps standing between them and the outcome they want. And a lack of sunlight is just one of them. But nonetheless, yeah, this is where I think we should always consider that uh, compound effect of all these little things, which in themselves add up to an absolutely massive thing. But equally how there's always going to be a lot of people who don't seem to suffer um, in that there's really good reason to uh, believe that if we are somewhat considerate, uh, conservative with our exposure to the various man-made chemicals and we take steps to ensure that our liver has the resources it needed, needs to rise to these challenges. It often does just that. Um, so yeah, in that regard, I think the, the, the beauty of there being so many different factors that our body needs is that yes, sometimes it does feel like, how can I how can I tend to all of these changes that, you know, these practitioners are suggesting? Um, but also at the same time, we've got so many opportunities to make changes to help us on our way. And that's always easier to do before the metabolism becomes compromised, before it crashes. Yeah, I'm, like you get stuck into these vicious cycles which drag people down and down and down. And then when uh, they... They, it becomes unavoidable to do something about it, then it becomes very difficult to pick this apart. And particularly like you're saying, uh, liver health uh, central, because when you start laying down um, hepatic fat, uh, then liver functions or all the other liver functions like detoxification, getting rid of all of the stuff that's in our environment, um, proper bile flow, all of that side of things, then becomes a challenge. And so it kind of, 
gets compounded uh, worse and worse. And then suddenly somebody who's been to lots of different people and seen lots of different specialists and they can't, um, because with a very reductionist model, we're looking at uh, individualist things um, to solve when really uh, we want to kind of take a more global approach. And so you touched on the organic acids test as a way to do that. I mean, it's an incredible test and um, I'm really impressed when I've been working with you, your um, capacity to use that to just tell so much about all sorts of different um, all sorts of different systems of the body. So um, do you think that's the best way to kind of evaluate these problems early on uh, to see potential future issues that come up and also when uh, cases are perhaps advanced to then to see where the lowest hanging fruit is, what we can do to really get this person out of, uh, out of the hole that they're in? Well, it is the one test that I ask all individuals to take before the initial consultation. Um, so whilst I think there's always limitations in identifying anything as the best test for giving us confirmation on what is the case, what is not the case and what might be the case, I am yet to come across any test that can do that with such efficiency. There's 75 different markers that are giving us information as to a whole host of different areas around the body. So it means that when I'm taking the case history, I'm not normally actually extracting answers from that. I'm extracting questions. We're further clarifying and whittling down those questions by building that picture of the current patterns, the day-to-day -day symptom profile, so on and so forth. But by marrying all that up against what we're seeing in the organic acids test, we've ruled out a lot of the potential explanations. In other words, we can come away from a single session in an individual who might have a whole complex array of challenges. And what we've got is what I would call the obvious uh, obstacles that we can start tending to. And I don't necessarily look at that as you know, the, the way to build the ultimate protocol. What I'm looking at there is, well, if we tend to those obvious obstacles, we're going to give this individual a fair chance. We're going to give a fair chance to these various different pathways that we've identified as uh, uh, subject to maladaptive burdens, etc. And we see what happens. And in every case, there will be certain patterns that improve and disappear. There'll be certain patterns which show resistance. But now what we've done is we've identified which areas are going to need more intensive support and we have reduced the noise to identify how are they interconnecting with other areas of what are the most appropriate options here and we've also seen some improvements on that first round so so that's where yeah i would always look to try and reduce the noise through the use of these uh, yeah, obvious interventions. And having done so, we're left with a much quieter picture, one that guides us towards what actually is going to need more specific steps. And that's often where looking at stool testing or looking at a fatty acids profile or looking at hormonal panels that can now tell us, well, OK, of this area that is come to our attention of this area that has shown resistance, shown that there's something additional going on beyond those more global burdens that we identified. Well, now let's find out the specifics. Let's actually get precise. And we are then told where we need to go from there on out to the finish line. Sure. Great. Yeah, I definitely think the kind of metabolomic testing, like the organic acids test is going to be definitely uh, playing a big part in the future uh, as technology increases also it's probably going to become much more accessible you could imagine like um, in clinics you could have sort of instant testing one day of these sorts of markers that then could give a, 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 a feedback straight away on how the person is progressing what are the main uh, areas and I think it's a really exciting area of um, of, of health and medicine well I was having a 
it's exciting in that we are absolutely seeing uh, more people take these tests, more practitioners deploy them. But it's also clear there's a bit of growing pains um, in that so often I will see people who have done an organic acids test and the automated printout uh, essentially said, oh, you have low CoQ10, take CoQ10. Oh, you have low B2, take B2. And that has been the net sum of what they got from it. And that's where I feel like it is worthwhile just emphasizing to anyone who's listening, who's done some of these tests and has felt like, well, that didn't really tell me anything. They always tell us a lot and it's always a lot more than a, a computerized printout will provide. Context and using it to answer questions, not to simply be passively told is where it's at. Uh, so worth just delineating, uh, yeah, just taking the test isn't enough. Examining it, understanding it is where we bear some very, very delicious fruit. Sure. Yeah, it's clear that the uh, algorithms have got a long way to go before they um, give us some some useful information like that. But uh, uh, perhaps more than that, it's more about a philosophy behind it as well, because from my point of view, as a recently graduated naturopath, my focus is always on what's causing it, uh, not just looking at what we see, but what's behind it, what's led to that situation. And so there's the tendency, perhaps in um, allopathic medicine, just to say, there's the problem, you need more of this, you need less of this, problem solved. And of course, this is an approach which has worked in the past in perhaps uh, acute disease situations like where allopathic medicine evolved, wartime, where you needed uh, acute care, you needed to patch people up and get them better, deal with infections, deal with um, uh, physical traumas and so on. Um, but now, of course, um, things have evolved a great deal. We've got new challenges. And one of the challenges, I think, is to look beyond what we see on the test, look beyond the numbers and to say, OK, what's going on? What's going on for this person in their lives, uh, psycho-emotionally, physically, energetically? How are they living and um, how have they lived, you know, for the last few decades? And that's obviously that's a challenge to change mindsets like that. Um, but it's also really exciting because it means that when you start to, to focus in on root causes, then even if it may be a slower process, you're likely to make more, more lasting changes in, in that person. Well, the reality is for a lot of people, they will never see the benefits that I've just spoken of, regardless of the dosage, the the form of whatever um, whatever response we deploy uh, to tend to the issue shown on, say, the organic acid test. And that's not because it doesn't work in them. It's because we'll often have to deal with their pro illness plan before they have a fair chance of responding to the pro health plan. And their pro illness plan may well be their life. That is to say the 14 hours a day they're doing in a high stress job that they hate, surrounded by people they despise. And then, yeah, going home to a house that has maybe environmental issues, maybe mold exposure, maybe there's insufficient time to actually sit, rest, breathe, digest all the basic stuff. And this is where, yeah, there may also be some need to tend to the stored stress, the this trauma, etc., that may be held in the central nervous system, uh, without which we're constantly going to see a disconnect between what they are aware of, but what their limbic system is responding to and preparing their system for, uh, preparing for a physical challenge again and again, which is redistributing the energy. And that's where, yeah, there's a lot of focus on the power of the hormonal modulation, mitochondrial support, digestive uh, issues, all of these things, and they are massively powerful. But what we're often dealing with there is how the body is using its resources at various different compartments. 
it's not getting those resources because the system is adamant that the resources will be sent elsewhere. We are at an impasse. And so, yeah, it's absolutely the case that we're, what, 80 years into this paradigm that we can loosely refer to as Western medicine. And it's done very well for car accidents, for traumatic injuries, etc. But for healthcare, it fails. And we've seen that. We've seen the most spectacular decline in, in human health ever recorded since this experimental form of medicine was brought in in 1950. It's not gone well. Um, and that one pill... And I think to, to, um, to push back on that, some people will say, oh, it's just because we're living longer. Um, of course, we're going to, um, you know, immunosenescence, uh, chronic inflammation and so on. But I remember um, a study uh, from the University of Alabama a few years ago that found that in young adults, so this was 18 to 44 years, they found something like 40% of, um, of the people tested had signs of insulin resistance. So it's something fundamentally, of course, genetics and longevity are going to play a role, but there's something fundamentally in the way that we're living. And I think you only have to go outside and look around and see traffic and breathe this and breathe the, the, the pollution and uh, look at what people are eating and uh, look at people's circadian rhythms to realize that there's, um, you, you know, there's something much bigger going on uh, than that. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And yeah, in that regard, I think the life expectancy thing is hugely overplayed. Um, and it makes sense. There's a lot of reasons why those institutions such as the media who are intertwined financially with those that benefit from the existing paradigm used for healthcare. Um, of course, they're naturally going to be cheerleaders for, for the idea. Um, but those figures that are used as the, the whole central feature of the argument, where well, they're based on average life expectancy, which is hugely influenced by childhood mortality. So I think very few people are aware that you can go back to the logs of the uh, Royal Society of Medicine to see what was the age of uh, average death. Uh, for the members going back to the 1700s, 1800s, uh, not very different to today. You can look at those records kept in Venice hundreds of years back, not that different. Then we've also got uh, the very decent records in, in Britain of all places as to the life expectancy. So for women aged 15 and over, that is to say those that have avoided uh yeah the, the childhood mortality in as far back as uh the turn of the 20th century their life expectancy was already in the 60s and certainly uh had already hit the the 70s by the time we brought in the antibiotics the surgeries the various other uh, medications to to extend life um and without getting too bogged down with those numbers that I mentioned, is there or is there not more fat children than there ever was when I was at school? <laughs> there are substantially more. That's not anything to do with the fact that- I think children we've, um, we've seen the photos of like uh, beach sides in the seventies and eighties where everybody is, uh, everybody is, um, looks model skinny sort of thing, but uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. He is. It's two generations, slightly less than. And so, yeah, it, it is very interesting when you know, we, we consider that humans are extremely adaptable. We mentioned it earlier, but it also plays out in how we adapt to our circumstances. We become normalized to things so much so much quicker than than I think anybody really imagines. So people have got used to the fact that the average 65 year old in Britain right now is taking five different medications. So that is like, yeah, but 
they're older, so why would they not? And I think that if that's your average, um, so yeah, they, there's <laughs> it's everywhere we look. We have to choose not to look at it if we uh, want to, to build. And I think um, I think it's the right tool for the right time, just like with insulin being used in the right place at the right time. Also, um, obviously, modern medicine has its place. If I'm in a car crash, I, I want to be going to a hospital and, and be getting uh, attention, be obviously. Like exactly. But if I've got some sort of chronic metabolic dysfunction um, that is um, due to my lifestyle, stress, circadian rhythms, diet, relationships, and so on, it's clear that I'm going to have to take quite a radically different approach. So that's about all today for part one of my interview with Marek. Uh, be sure to join us in a few days time when I post part two, where we start to look at some of the solutions that Marek uses in practice. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at the ketogenic diet and Marek shares with us when this may be appropriate and when it may not be appropriate as well. And also some of the most common issues that uh, people may run into when they start on their ketogenic journey. We also get into healthcare in the wider sense and perhaps some of the changes that Marek would like to see um, when dealing with this, um, this uh, new reality or the last few decades of chronic metabolic health issues and how a shift to individualized medicine um, is going to be key to be able to deal with that on a, on a societal level. So if you liked that episode, then be sure to subscribe on YouTube go over to insulin360.com where you can join the newsletter and receive regular updates. And that's about all for today. Thank you and have a great day.